Hello, everybody. Uh, you're welcome to our February edition of Africa Talks Tech. Uh, so today we are going to be talking to Dr. Onfrey Akanezu. And uh, Sam, what are we going to be discussing with Dr. today on the show? So we're going to be discussing transforming the education system in Africa through technology with a little bit of Dr. Humphrey's journey from Nigeria to Spain to Italy and then back again to Nigeria and entrepreneurship. So without much of ado, please kick back, um, take your lockdown shoes off and enjoy the show. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to our February episode of Africa Talks Tech. Uh, we have a very interesting guest on the show with us today, Dr. Omfre Akanozu. Dr. Omfre is the director of Rome Business School, Nigeria. Uh, but first, uh, my name is Kazim. I'm from Nigeria, and I'm also based here in Nigeria. And uh, you guessed it, uh, I don't do this alone. So I have my brother and my partner, Samuel Eskin, on the show with me. So Sam, it's over to you now. Oh, thank you, Kazim, and welcome, Dr. Humphrey. Uh, my name is Sam Erskine. I'm originally from Ghana, but I'm based down in the UK, and I'm the head of customer experience for a large organization. And on this journey um, of Africa Talks Tech, I'm really looking forward to connecting with uh, my brother in Nigeria and our esteemed guest, Dr. Humphrey. Sam, um, you, you want to start with the first question now to Dr. Yes, first and foremost, um, just tell us um, who you are and what your current position is before um, we dive into getting your thoughts on um, the topic of this show. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Kazim and Sam. I'm happy to be here. Um, like you rightly called me, my name is uh, Humphrey Akanazo. I am the country director of Rome Business School, Nigeria. Is a school I happen to be a, an alumni of. I studied in Rome Business School in Italy, and then I was able to convince the owners of Rome Business School to come to Nigeria and establish the school in Africa. Let me put it that way. So I am the country director of same school right now. Thank you very much. And that leads me to the first question for um, our conversation. Having looked at your profile and spoken to Kazim, I can see that you've had a very interesting um, educational career journey. So can you share why you decided to um, go to Italy and Spain um, for your education? Yes, um, it's, this is the kind of question I, I usually get from a lot of people because, you know, Nigerians would like to go to UK, would like to go to Canada, US, but why Italy and Spain? Uh, my background uh, and also opportunity. Um, I happen to uh, be a Catholic. <laughs> I was a seminarian. Uh, in the church, in the Catholic church, and I passed through the seminary school and all my studies have been there. And um, I happened to, uh, you know, get scholarship um, in Italy, to study in Italy. First, I started with uh, my philosophy, then I did theology, then I discovered that um, I really uh, have to go into education because right from kids, I love education. My father was a lecturer. My, my mother was a headmistress, worked uh, with the governor as an educationist. Uh, and it's, it's just my life. I love education. So I had to leave to pursue my career in the educational sector. And the, the first place I, I you know, uh, studied was uh, Roma III University. That is the third university of Rome, Roma III University where I did my uh, master's in education and social services management. Um, it is a combination of uh, uh, educating people coming from outside Italy, uh, probably people uh, who are taking refuge in Italy, people 
uh, who want to get integrated. You know how it is when some Africans, you know, uh, people from the Middle East travel to Europe, they want to get integrated. So that's basically the kind of education I did in Roma 3. And then um, I now saw that, okay, I at some point I would like to go back to Nigeria. Honestly, I've never had in my dream to, you know, spend my life in Europe or outside Nigeria. So I'd always thought that I would still come back to Nigeria. And when I discovered what it takes to be an educationist, you know, here in this part of the world, we used to think that uh, when you say you're an educationist, it means that you had one primary school or one secondary school like that, or you want to be a professor. But, you know, over there, you will see educational consultants, you know, doing big things. And one of the key skills is to be a marketer. You know, every school, every executive school would like to enroll students. So you have to be an enrollment specialist. And one of the ways to do this is to do something in marketing, to understand how to do marketing, you know, coming from the background of philosophy, theology, you know, I needed to do something outside that sphere and um, I had to do masters in marketing and communication with Rome Business School. That was how I entered Rome Business School. And then the other masters I did uh, was just for fun. That is masters in peace building management because in my course um, of working in Italy, in Rome, particularly uh, with the uh, municipal of Rome. I was interacting with refugees. I was, uh, in fact, I, I had to go to Lampedusa uh, in the southern part of Italy, uh, where I saw a lot of our brothers and, uh, you, know, um, you know, what happens there. And when the opportunity uh, came for me to do masters and peace building management with the European uh, nation, I grabbed it because it's one of the things that, um, you know, happens in this part of the world, crisis, you know, social crisis, um, a lot of, um, uh, you know, sea wars and, you know, how it is. So I had to grab it and I did that master's, but my focus was mainly on the Africa within the Maghreb. So we did a lot of research around there. It also helped me in my career um, as a social worker. And when I finished that, I wanted to come back to Nigeria. In fact, my thesis uh, in the master's uh, in education and social services was on quality assurance. So everything I was doing was tailored towards being an educationist. So my final project was in that. I, I measured in, I researched in quality assurance and I was able to trace the qualifications framework of most of the European countries and compared it with what we think or we believe we have in Nigeria as a qualifications framework, which looks um, like some similar to WAEC. Do you understand? I will explain that later. And when I wanted to come back, you know how Nigeria is, you need to have a big profile for you to operate <laughs> in that, uh, you know, in that sector, if you say you're an educationist. You know, people will be looking at you, uh, you don't have a PhD, you know, things like that. These things don't really matter over there in Europe and America. But I had to go for my PhD. I needed to change. Uh, Italy was already suffocating me. So I had to move to Spain. And um, I, I also majored uh, in education psychology. But I took a different turn because you know, um, psychology, people are doing counseling, work psychology, you know, uh, there are different areas of psychology. In order to do something that would be suitable for Nigeria, because I've always had uh, the Nigerian market in my mind, I used to hear about the EDC, EDC, the Entrepreneurship Development Center by LBS. I needed to do something like that. So I focused my research on entrepreneurship education. What okay. I would like to um, just build on um, briefly, if I just connect the dots between your journey from Italy to Spain and yeah. then your present day career, how has this diverse educational choice helped you in building your career 
in a very sort of like, you know, brief summary, addressing them more in the eyes of if somebody were to stand new today and they looked at you, how would you say this diverse educational choice has helped in building a career? Okay, for you to manage a school like this, there are different areas and it requires diverse skills. For instance, in Rome Business School, we have the marketing and sales department. We have the administrative department. Uh, they are into the HR uh, you know, activities and accounting. Uh, we also have the didactic and career service department. They are into the planning the programs, implementing the trainings and uh, providing career services to students. If you look at the courses I did, they focused on these um, different areas. Okay, marketing and sales, of course, I did marketing and communication. Um, if you come to administration, um, I did psychology. And of course, uh, a lot of um, HR activities are done in the administrative department. What I did not learn in my educational career was the PL, you know, accounting. But I had to learn it on the job as you know in some of my short courses. And then if you go to the didactic, which is my core area um, uh, training, um, I have a lot of um, educational uh, background in uh, training, you know, developing um, a curriculum, implementation, designing and also um, executive um, um, training. If I, when I came back to Nigeria, the first thing I did was to work with Meseran and we are training the public sector. I was, um, we are training them in Dubai, in UK. I was anchoring those training. So that's my, uh, my uh, how would I put it? My expertise, that's my background, my core, you know, training. So you see those courses I did have something to do with this different department. So education management is not just coming to teach, or uh, you know, it it has a lot, a lot to do with enrollment, uh, marketing, administration, you know, training, implementation, managing students' learning experience. You know, you want to satisfy them. In fact, everything we do, the goal of everything we do in this different department is to make sure that the students are satisfied. Once they are not satisfied, there is a problem in one of these um, departments. So, so let's, let's get into the meat proper now. Uh, we know that Africa is blessed with abundant natural resources, but the problem is uh, most of the time we're unable to harness uh, these resources that we have here in Africa. Yet we have African schooling all over the world, right? So, so my question is, can you please tell us how we can revamp our education system in Nigeria and in Africa as a whole now, such that it prepares the African people for entrepreneurship and leadership roles? And that's something that can help them now to take advantage of these abundant resources that we have here in Africa. Thank you very much, Kazim, for that question. In fact, it's been a hot debate in what, in some of the um, conferences I attend when we talk about um, you know curriculum designing curriculum within the African educational system, especially in West Africa. Most of the uh, you know curriculum we use here, you will be hearing Montessori. Montessori is not Nigeria; it's not Africa; it's Italian. You know, um, we use um, the UK. Uh, system. In fact, in Nigeria, we don't even know the one we are using. Some some people are using America, some use UK. You know, <laughs> they combine a lot of things. Um, I think uh, we have to look into the curriculum and stick to it, maintain it. During my research, the only sector um, in our educational system that had something that we can say is African is Nigeria that sol solves our problem is what we can get from our polytechnics. But you know, unfortunately here, we don't really take them serious. Do you understand? So they have a good curriculum that, you know, uh, focuses on what can help 
the society, the community where that learning experience is being implemented. So uh, I want us, I would like us to um, uh, leverage on best practices, what they do in India, what they do in Europe, their curriculum takes care of their traditional cultural needs and answers those questions that we try to use the Western educational system to answer. At the end of the day, the training you are doing is focusing on how you can, you know, work in an American company, uh, in a UK company, in an Italian company. Now, there is something they do which we can do uh, very well. If you look at um, the European Qualifications Framework, um, it has seven levels, okay? Um, Sam, you will know in, in UK, you have all these, your level one, two, three, four, five, six, eight, you know. Those levels are tied to some learning outcomes. And those learning outcomes are designed to solve European countries' problem. So the EQF is what covers all the EU countries, including the UK and also um, countries like uh, the extra European uh, union countries. So uh, each of these countries have what they call national uh, national qualifications framework. And those national qualifications framework are tailored to the EQF. So if as Africans, we have our own qualifications framework that addresses some learning outcomes that we make African youths, the Af African uh, you know, young generation, to address entrepreneurship, uh, entrepreneurial needs, leadership needs. Each country will now plug in their own specific problems to what we want to achieve as Africa. For instance, in Nigeria, tell me what has happened to history. You cannot throw away history. Any educational system that has nothing to do with it that, that does not go back to how the country started. We, we have a history. Uh, our educational system, our curriculum is not focusing on how to address all those historical challenges we've been having, where we are today, how we started. There is no way we can develop. What we will be getting at the end of the day is what I call opportunity entrepreneurs. Opportunity entrepreneurs are in our universities today. You see our graduates when they come out, you know, because of job insecurity, there are no jobs. Uh, they tend to, you know, launch themselves into anything that can give money. And when you ask them, they say they want to be a business owner. They want to be an entrepreneur. Do you understand? So um, they just be doing things to see if they can make money. If eventually that thing starts giving them money, they will settle with it and say it's their passion. But in Europe, in America, there's what we call knowledge entrepreneurship, um, innovation in entrepreneurship. These guys, they, everything is well planned. You know, they have long-term plan. You know, they keep on innovating. So I believe that we have a lot to do with our curriculum. Thank you very much for that, Dr. Humphrey. And tied to that, um, it's a new trend in entrepreneurship. So um, I was listening to that piece and it reminded me of uh, another show we had around blockchain where um, we spoke to um, a young lady in um, Africa, that, in South Africa, that shared about using blockchain to solve Africa's problem like farming, etc. Bearing that in mind and with a slight pivot, um, today not everybody goes to the same traditional educational path and then through to um, their real careers so there's this notion of side hustles so the example of youtube entrepreneurs etc now my um, question um, to yourself and try and get a bit of your thinking as an entrepreneur specialist how are you seeing this intersecting with education so those that think you know what I'm just going to have a YouTube channel and then I'm going to be rich. Um, how do you see um, this new world combining with some of the uh, areas that you've been talking about? Okay. Um, first of all, I encourage side hustle. If you ask my employees, 
um, they will tell you that I encourage side hustle because um, it also helps you as an employee to, you know, manage your own department very well, know the issues the employer or the business owner, you know, um, have sometimes in trying to run his business. Now, yes, uh, those are soft um, and uh, what I would call soft and hard um, entrepreneurial endeavors. And uh, it could be also uh, likened to social entrepreneurship, though some people think social entrepreneurship is only when you open an NGO. Now, um, uh, leveraging on those um, platforms, the YouTube, um, the Instagram, um, even LinkedIn, uh, you know, to do a lot of things requires also a, a, a lot of education because for you to create content, you need to really present a content that people uh, will be interested in, that is readable, and that um, captures or catches people's interest. And those things, they are not something you just, um, you know, wake up one day and you want to start. So your educational endeavor, you know, um, education is not only reading. When you come to school, you meet a lot of people doing different things and you can learn from each other. So education can help uh, young people to calibrate their entrepreneurial endeavors in those platforms and do things that can increase um, you know, um, social development and as well as make money for them. You know what all those platforms have cost um, in recent times in our society? So education can channel those energy instead of using them to destroy the you know the the social structure we can use them to make money to do things that people will like that you know we bring money to the people um the young uh, stars doing it one of one of it is i was discussing with one of my staff who is very very good um in so in digital uh, marketing and she told me what one trisha b you should know about trisha b uh kazin is on instagram yeah, Trisha B is an Instagram influencer. What is what is she doing? Trisha B is into using he, her skills in Instagram in, in influencer to market training. If you want to train, Trisha B is can market. He has over fifty six thousand followers, and so she started with little like what you guys are doing. You know, people started following her, you know, she started building her community, you know, and today Trisha B has over 56K and she uses it to do both adverts. So if you want to advertise your product, you can go to her. You want to sell your training, you can go to her, you know, and we have a lot of them like that. And these guys are very, very good. You know, these are young, the millennials and the generation Zs. They are very, very good uh, with the social media. So I, I think our educational system should start putting these things into consideration. If we don't, they will use them, they will use them in another way. We have to be very, very strategic and purposeful um, with um, our education, you know, with regard to this. Next, I want to ask you about transforming our universities, right? When we see other universities abroad, you know, comparing them to the universities that we have here in Africa, we can see that there's an obvious gap, right? So, so given that you're into the education system yourself, how do you think the African universities can transform, you know, the current system that we are currently using now so that I were able to catch up with the rest of the universities in the developed world. And how do you also think we can create this culture of innovation within our university system here in Africa? Yeah, it is is something very simple, which we are already doing in in, in rural business school. You know, uh, there is this difference between um, implementation strategy in education and um, the banking system of education. 
what uh, most of our universities do here, the regular universities do here, is banking system of education, whereby they, ha they, hand, they hand you, you know, give you handouts, um, theoretical um, teaching, you know, um, curriculum is not um, reviewed um, according to the market needs, you know. Um, in Europe and America, you can imagine that curriculum, courses change, you know, there will be a course that they will enact and they will, in the, in the enactment, it will be good that this course will expire in the next uh, four or five years. Those courses are designed based on the uh, market trend or the social trend, you know, during that time. So they pay attention to what happens in their society both in the economic uh, um, sector, the social sector, and um, um, you know, other sectors. So, but here, we don't do that. You know, the same curriculum we used, you know, 20 years ago, we are using it here. So what I will advise is let the, the, um, the, the ministries in charge of designing curriculum, uh, you know, and the universities, begin to do research on what can develop us, what can solve our problems, and um, design their curriculum to solve those problems, and let curriculum be reviewed, if possible, every year, every year. If we can do this, we will be able to, you know, uh, attend to some of the problems that we are having in our societies, Right now, go to the universities. How many universities are delivering course in, in, in business intelligence, in data science management? How many of our universities go abroad? You see, uh, in fact, most of their courses, you will be asking yourself, this kind of courses exist? Do they exist? We are still, you know, doing the traditional courses here. So um, let us also be flexible in accrediting such courses. If you design such courses now, take it to the National Universities Commission, for instance, it will take years before they accredit it, thereby, you know, delaying and uh, making the whole thing very, very difficult, um, you know, for development to occur. We have to be flexible. We have to be progressive. We have to look beyond, you know, uh, what can benefit us. You know what I'm talking about. So people have a lot of ideas. Look at you, Kazin. Look at you, Sam. You know, you have ideas. If you take some of these ideas to where, you know, when we talk about SWOT analysis, there are certain things we cannot do our, for, by ourselves. Do you understand? The threats, you know, to what um, our potentials, what we can, what we want to do. So there are things the government has to do. We can't do it. So you design those things, very good things that can help, but it takes time before um, you know, they approve them for implementation. So it delays development. So we are doing, we have a lot of intelligent professors, smart guys in the university. They are doing a lot of things. Let me give you an example, okay? What happens in Spain? in the Spanish system of education, okay? So Spanish system of education, they have two different types of um, certificates they give, okay? There's the one they call official, there's the one they call pro that is university's own certificate. Why did they do that? Spain has a very strict, you know, um, certification policy. So every year they will say how many certificates they will you know, list, how many certificates they want to issue, the degrees and all of that, the government does. But they know that um, certain trends need to be taken care of in the society. So they allow universities to design courses that will solve some problems in the society and implement them, though they may not get official recognition immediately but in the society you can still use it at work you can you know still use it and um, apply to other universities but it has not gotten as um, an official recognition from the spanish government so you know these are people that understand how things work how you know they want to develop um, their country i think we we can leverage on all these things and you can see they are not um, hard. They are not hard to do. So with Absolutely. this, 
we, we, we can change the status quo, we can revamp what we are doing in our universities and uh, increase our you know, propensity towards innovation. It seems um, seeing you up for uh, our last end of the um, conversation, right? the last question of the conversation. However, I wanted to call out something because I'm also a product of um, part African education. Um, so I agree with everything that you've said, which is enlightening. And I wanted to add that uh, that's why we have that trend of Africans being super educated because we first um, take our local education and then we have to take external education to augment it. So if I were to try and summarize it all, this premise that you're sharing is we can bring that extra education in-house as well which is that lens of what am I actually going to use this for? Because I, I still remember studying about the Agama lizard. I don't know how it's helped me with my career now. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, but the, the lecturers drilled us into learning about a lot of stuff that's in the old curriculum, but you always had to add the additional curriculum. So um, I don't want to put words in anybody's mouth, but I'm assuming that you were talking about that additive side now being made really uh, more standardized and natural as um, you educate locally exactly 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 if you come if you come to run business school we do that a lot um uh, yeah we have um, um the italian curriculum you know our head office uh, we get their curriculum but then uh, those are principles for instance principles of management is universal do you understand? But we we try to bring in um, local professionals to interpret those um, principles to address our local problems. Kazim can you know testify to that. So these guys they come with the local experience and also international experience. So how does this solve our problem here? Yes, we already have some background, of course. We are the most uh, intelligent people in the world. Ask yourself, ask yourself, you see a young kid here who is not doing well in the university, okay? He's getting three GP or two point something, but once he leaves the country and goes to the US or the UK and enrolls in any of the university, he will start doing very well. He will start beating, you know, his or her classmates, coming out a star. Why? Because of the framework. Because the system has made it in such a way that it enhances learning. We can do the same here. We have the money. We have the money. But, you know, the letter that starts with C doesn't allow us to, you know, uh, <laughs> So you're, you're, you're right. You're correct in what you're saying. Yes. I'm not sure if you have any more questions to ask. Um, but my last question uh, for Doctor is um, talking about the technological skills now, you know, that uh, you've acquired yourself. So what role has uh, the technological advances that you've acquired played in your own career? And uh, if we have the next generation of African talents looking up to you to what you've done. So how can it also help them? Yeah, um, okay, uh, let me start with this uh, short story. While I was working uh, with some refugees uh, in Italy, there was this guy from Sudan, okay, um, that, uh, you know, told me something. I didn't take it serious until I came back to Nigeria. You know, he said, Humphrey, I know you have the zeal to go back to Nigeria. This was a refugee. Um, I would, I'm coming from Africa. Don't think that we are backward, okay? Because I've spent a couple of years out there. See, if you want to succeed, you need to look into ICT. IT is going, growing faster in Africa. So go and do something in ICT. Not all this, your education, this uh, qualification, blah, blah, blah. Go and do something. I didn't take it serious. When I came back, I realized that uh, the kids, my brothers, younger ones I left at home are doing a lot of things, you know, internet and uh, a lot of things we are going on. So I had to swing into action. 
and started upgrading myself in digital marketing because that is where I can easily, you know, um, upgrade myself in. I didn't do computer science. So I started everything digital, everything digital using the platforms. I know a lot of platforms for education, a lot of app, apps for education. And when I now started Rome Business School in 2020, the opportunity course to use that my skill to beat so many educational establishments here. When the pandemic started, I already knew that Listen, <laughs> um, something is going to happen. There, there will be a lockdown because lockdown had already started in Italy, in um, China. So I told my team, let us find a way of doing our classes online. Before everybody knew what was happening, before the lockdown, we had already bought laptops, bought um, smartphones, you know, prepared ourselves, locked on to Zoom. Um, uh, uh, trained our students, uh, gave them the orientation, our faculty, immediately lockdown started, we didn't stop. We continued um, lectures until after lockdown, until today we have even advanced in our online delivery. So we do blended, our classrooms are digitalized. So my advice to um, younger ones is that technology is everything now. Um, do not um, um, uh, take anything for granted, you know, because in every day people are innovating. You know, look at the apps, go to uh, Google Play. The, the app you are using today, in the next two days, they say update, you know, something new is coming, if not a new app that will take that one away from the market. So my advice is they already know, they are the Gen Zs, they already know this. Um, let them not take um, anything technology for granted. Oh, Thank oh. you very much. I, I don't really have any more other than to say that looking forward to talking to you some more. Uh, I don't have my master's yet, but now I know where to go for it. I, I believe I can go back to Africa and bring it back to Europe um, to um, flip the reverse of uh, On that note, Kazim, um, I'll leave you to close us out. Um, with um the final part of the show sir uh, all right Th thank you very much again uh, dr Humphrey, for joining us on our february episode of africa talks tech all right so here is what we've got time for on today's episode of the africa talks tech uh, so if you do find this information useful please do give it a thumbs up and uh, please subscribe to our channel so it, again it's africa talks tech on youtube so from myself, from Sam and Doctor, it is a bye bye now from us, and uh, we'll do this again another time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.